Welcome back to the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. This is Justin Gary. Memories can fade, can't they? I was reading an article recently on the Harvard School of Health website about memories. It said that of the many memories we make every day, not all of them get stored. In fact, reports said that only those marked as meaningful are recorded in your brain's long-term files. The article quoted Dr. Andrew Budson, a neurologist, and he said, We have a system in our brains that tags memories that are important in some way, so we'll remember them in the future. The two things that affect whether a memory will be tagged or not for long-term storage, emotion and personal significance. Emotion. That's why memories of things like a wedding will stick around, because it's a highly emotional event, and the brain is dealing with a whole lot of brain chemical activity during the event, and those brain chemicals are active as the memories are recorded. The emotion hit the record button in your brain. And then there is the tagging of memories that take place when there is a personal significance involved. Like today, you might remember what you ate this morning for breakfast, and you might recall what clothes you wore to work yesterday. But in a few weeks or a year from now, well, you won't remember that stuff because it wasn't too important to you, not significant enough for you personally. And of course, memories can fade. So what can we do to not lose those precious memories? The article says as special memories were being made, things like sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, thoughts or feelings were being stored in one part of the brain, the cortex, and then bound together as a memory by another part of the brain, the hippocampus, and tagged so that the frontal lobes could retrieve the pattern of information later. That means a cue from the environment, something like hearing a song or a certain sound or smell or taste, or a cue that we personally generate, like thinking about that vacation you once took or your graduation. Those things can help jog your memory. The more specific, the better. A specific cue is more likely to result in a pattern match that helps your brain pull up a dusty memory buried in those files tucked away in our brains. Now, I'm not sure Dr. Budson thinks the way that I do, But we are truly, fearfully, and wonderfully made, aren't we? Our brains are complex and amazing, right? So much more than a random result of evolution, for sure. On today's episode, we see Paul walking down memory lane. As he looks back at a time in his life and ministry that was full of emotion, passion, excitement, danger, uncertainty, and also full of personal significance, as his life and ministry and faith experienced a brand new season, the emotion and the significance embedding those memories deep from that season of life. On the last podcast, as we started the book of Philippians and season two of the Verbatim Word podcast, Paul and Timothy wrote their old friends in Philippi, and Philippi held a dear place in their hearts. These people had come through for Paul a number of times, and he loved them for it, especially now as they had sent aid for him in Rome, where Paul is under house arrest waiting to appear before Caesar. And we looked at prisons, those seasons in life where we feel bound or stuck and how God can use them mightily for his purposes for our lives, and that we can endure such seasons with a heart of gratitude and joy with the right perspective, and that God does open prison doors. He is able and will set us free. We recognize that suffering for the name of Christ is a reality and that God can use it for his glory. And we also looked at the happy mistakes of life those things that were not planned or on the agenda, but that God directs in his sovereign will or redeems for his plans and purposes. Since after all, Paul had not planned to go to Philippi, and yet it turned out to be one of the most fruitful steps of ministry of all of Paul's missionary journeys. Now on this podcast, we dust off Paul's memory files and take a look back as we get started in Philippians 1 verses 3 through 8. After finishing his introduction, Paul writes in verses 3 and 4, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you all with joy. As Paul is homebound in prison in Rome, he has plenty of time on his hands to think, to jog his memory of all the places he has been, people he's seen, things he's experienced. And he says in those verses, every remembrance, meaning that he thought of these people in Philippi often. Always, and in every prayer of his, meaning this happened regularly, the Philippians were often on his mind and his heart. And as we saw in the intro, the memories that were tied to strong emotions and the memories rooted in personal significance, well, those memories would remain strong and the memories of Philippi remain strong for Paul. 
Think of the emotions that took place in that trip to Philippi over a decade earlier for Paul the Apostle. The emotions of seeing new believers in Europe getting saved, the first Europeans. The emotions of being beaten for your faith. The emotions of being thrown in prison and yet praising God in the midst. The emotions of deep and sweet fellowship with that small church that started there. And the emotions of seeing God be faithful, who had led them there instead of east into Asia Minor, which had been their original plan. What's more, think of the personal significance of that trip. To see God move them in a whole new direction of ministry into Europe, the first ones headed that direction. The bonding of the new team as Timothy had just joined them after splitting from Barnabas. The new move of the Spirit in a city where there was no synagogue, a departure from Paul's normal ministry pattern, and the personal significance of some deep relationships with that church. Relationships that had continued over the years as they had stayed in touch and those Philippian believers had continued to support Paul even financially a number of times. The memories for Paul were still vibrant. And as he said in verse three, each time he thought about them, he thanked God every time. And notice he said, I thank my God. Paul had known of God for a long time, known of God. As a Jewish boy, he had been taught about God, the history and the origins of his people, the holy scriptures, the rituals and traditions, a deep part of his culture, part of his heritage. He learned more about God as he grew and matured, and he was sent to sit under a rabbi and prepared to be a Pharisee. And Paul had risen up in the ranks to become a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the leadership of the Jewish community. And yet, on the day he rode to Damascus to arrest the Christians that were there, when the bright light shined as the noonday sun, as we see in Acts chapter 9, he asked the question, who are you, Lord? At that point, Paul didn't know the Lord. He thought he knew the Lord. God was not a foreign concept by any means, but Paul had studied scripture, even served in religious capacities. And heck, he was even doing what he thought was God's work that day when he was headed to Damascus to arrest the Christians, who he thought were a sect. But that day, it was exposed. Paul did not know the Lord. God was not his God. Years later, Paul writes that here, saying, I thank my God. And God was his God now, a personal God, one that he had submitted to, yielded to, invited into his life. The fact is, God is God, but is he your God? Oh, he sits on the throne whether you acknowledge him or not. But regardless of whether you are 2 or 12 or 22 or 62 or 120, you need to have that conversation with God and ask him to be your God. And it's not like signing up with a new insurance company or asking an attorney to be your attorney or having a lawn guy to be your lawn guy or signing with a team or a college on signing day. Asking God to become your God is the most significant thing anyone can ever do. And while God longs to be our God, he can't, at least until some things are taken care of, because God is a holy God and we are not holy. We are sinful people through and through, even good people. We have all sinned and fallen short. We've missed the mark. And yet God still wants to be my God. So he made a way. He came as a man, lived and died apart from sin, Jesus Christ. And he extends forgiveness to you and I. He took our place so that if we repent of our sin, agreeing that we've been wrong and ask to be saved, inviting him into our lives, applying the blood of the cross to our sin and believing that we are forgiven in light of Christ's resurrection, then God becomes my God by faith, his grace. Paul had experienced that. All those years of being religious meant nothing. He asked the question, who are you, Lord, in Acts chapter 9? Because they had never truly met. And this might be surprising to some. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What a disappointing and surprising day that will be for some. A shocker for many who thought they were good with God, on good terms, tight with the man upstairs, as they might call him. And yet in practice, they continue in lawless ways, not submitting themselves to the ordinances of God, playing by their own rules, rather than inviting God to lead their lives, still living in sin. Sin being doing what I want instead of what God tells me is best for me. 
a self-righteousness rather than an imputed righteousness, a righteousness borrowed from Jesus because I could never establish my own. That's what it means to be saved. And that's what it means to have God be my God once again. Then and only then can we call him my God. When God is my God, there's a personal relationship. We talk with one another. His words come to life, the Bible. It leads me, it guides me, it informs me, it counsels me. When God is my God, I take him with me everywhere. I invite him to walk together with me in the daily, in the rough stuff, in the hardships, in the pursuits. I desire his companionship and can't fathom a day or moment apart from him. It's not like I pick him up for church on Sunday, have lunch with him, and then text him again next week to pick up things again. When God is my God, I start the day with him and he sustains me throughout. As David wrote in Psalm 63, oh God, you are my God. Notice David, like Paul, called him my God. Early will I seek you. First thing, before all else, before anyone else. My soul thirsts for you. Just like you get up in the morning or just hungry or thirsty, wanting something to start your day and get your body replenished. Your soul thirsts for him. My flesh, it longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And if you don't feed your flesh with the things of the spirit, well, it will go after the things of the flesh. When God is your God, you need him. You can't thrive or live apart from him. You are desperate for him. The phrase, my God, occurs 130 verses in the New King James Version. Everyone from Jacob to Moses to David to Ruth to Elijah calling him my God. What a privilege to call him my God. Is God your God? Do you know him? Are you saved? Do you walk with him daily? How tragic for those who will hear, I never knew you. I remember realizing at 12 years old at a vacation Bible school that Jesus came to save sinners on the cross and that I was a sinner. I was separated from him. He was not my God, but he could be. And all I had to do was ask by faith to repent and be saved and God would become my God. And you can do the same. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Returning to him, it makes God your God. There were people in Philippi who had come to know God as well. Paul's God, and now they could call him their God. God was their God too. And this camaraderie, this brotherhood, it brought joy to Paul. Listen to what Paul writes in verses 3 through 5. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. God was Paul's God and God was their God. And this brought Paul joy because in a world that rejects God and turns from God, there's joy in having those like-minded people around us, those who know the Lord too. What a bond we have. It can be quite a challenge going someplace alone where you don't know anyone like that first day at a new school or the first day at a new job or showing up at a new church or any other manner of things. I was summoned to jury duty recently, such an interesting civil experience, called together with 50 or so other complete strangers. And in the voir dire section, the process of questioning the jury, they asked some pretty scrutinizing questions to try and weed people out. It's actually a pretty uncomfortable situation. So in the midst of my jury pool, it was nice to find a few connections. As they called upon one juror for questioning, I was intrigued when I heard a last name I recognized. And on a break, I asked that juror if they were related to so-and-so who shared that same last name. And sure enough, this juror was. And suddenly I felt like I had a familiar face there. I felt a little less alone in that room. And even though I didn't know this person, I knew that someone they knew, and that brought a closeness. And later on, another juror approached me after they heard where I'd worked during my questioning and asked if I knew so-and-so, and sure enough, I did. It was one of my coworkers. And there was, again, another instant connection and comfort of feeling less alone because we knew someone in common. I tell you, those few connections and a few more that popped up in a random room of strangers in jury duty, it brought some joy to know I wasn't alone in a sea of strangers. And for Paul, it brought joy to know these Philippians knew God too. Because in a world that was growing ever hostile to Christ and the gospel, Paul rejoiced for the fellowship he could find with other followers of Jesus, those who knew him too, 
It's an instant bond being in the body of Christ. When you go someplace new, pray that God would bring you to believers, a new neighborhood, a new church, even in that new job, that God would open your eyes and that he would link you together because you need one another. And what joy we find when we find like-minded people who are following the Lord, especially in today's world. Paul rejoices for the fellowship he had with them from the first day and a fellowship that continued until that moment when he wrote these those things. And on this trip down memory lane, Paul, he thinks back to the first day, the early days in Philippi. He and his team had taken a step of faith. They were intending to go east, going east into Asia Minor, and the Spirit had said no. He redirected them until the vision pointed to Macedonia, a Macedonian call leading them to Europe, setting foot in Philippi. And in those early days, the fellowship of the first days, it started pretty small. In fact, we see in Acts 16, when they arrived, there was no synagogue to stop at in Philippi. That was usually Paul's first stop. He'd share with them there in the synagogue and about their long-awaited Messiah that he had come. All those things predicted in the scriptures that they had been fulfilled, but not in Philippi. Take a listen in Acts 16 verses 12 and 13. Paul and the group sailed and came to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And when we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. There was no synagogue there. This tells us a lot about Philippi. A synagogue could not be established unless there were at least 10 Jewish males in a city which means in this city, there was a very small population who worshiped the God of heaven. They were a minority, a very small minority. Notice too that Philippi was a colony, a Roman colony, that those there had all the rights of Rome. In fact, Philippi was known to be a place where many Roman officials went to retire. It was full of Romans, high-ranking Romans, so not exactly an attractive place for Jews to take up residence since the emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews from Rome as is mentioned a little bit later in Acts 18, when we find out that's how Priscilla and Aquila ended up in Corinth and in Paul's path. So finding a faithful remnant in Philippi was posing to be a problem for Paul. And Paul and his team had to venture outside the town to find them because that is what the faithful worshipers of Jehovah would do when there was no synagogue. They would meet somewhere outside or by the river for prayer. And there they found a group of women. I've been to this river actually in Philippi, this spot that they say historically they met. And I always imagined before I had gone a big flowing river, like the mighty Mississippi or something, but it was more like a tiny stream, just a few feet across, at least where I saw it. But there they were gathered in prayer. And Paul took the opportunity to share Jesus with them. As it says in verses 14 and 15, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. That was the first day. Down by the river, Lydia got saved and her family as well. God had opened her heart, prepared her heart to receive the things that Paul shared. God had been working in our heart prior to Paul's arrival. As Paul and his team were trying to book tickets to go east, Lydia was down there by this river weekly looking for answers, seeking to know God with no one to tell her until that day. Think of the divine hand of God in all of this. I mean, I bet Paul wrestled with going to Philippi. It was the other direction. That's where they were feeling led initially. And this was a Roman colony. The Jewish population was small. There was no synagogue. That man, when Paul arrived, he couldn't just do ministry the same way they had always done it. We like our routines, our patterns, to find something that works and stick with it, especially when it comes to ministry. We have our patterns and methods, and yet God has no problem coming in and shaking things up and making us once again depend on him and seek what the Spirit is doing so that we can join him. So the regular pattern for Paul and his group they couldn't do that in Philippi. There was no synagogue to go to. And he and his team had to look to the Lord and say, what now, Lord? Are there things that were once fruitful for you in ministry that are no longer? Take some time to consider and be open to the Lord redirecting. It's okay. It's not failure or a cause for frustration. It's an opportunity for the Lord to do something fresh and new. And he's inviting you to be a part of it. 
So when Paul and his team made it to the river, what was there? Just a handful of women. Paul usually reasoned with the Jewish leaders in the synagogue. Where were all the dudes that day down by the river? It would have been easy for Paul to shrug his shoulders and head back to the hotel, discouraged. But surprise, surprise, they sat down and spoke with the women who, met, who they met there. And they just started a conversation, a simple conversation. And in that conversation, they brought up the name of Jesus. And the Lord opened Lydia's heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. It's significant that it all started with going to pray by the river. Because years later, we see the thread continue here in Philippians. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. On the first day of their fellowship, prayer had been a part of it. And years later, Paul is still praying. Great things happen when God's people are praying, don't they? When people are seeking God individually and as a group. And Paul enjoyed the group prayer meeting in Philippi, and now he's enjoying the personal prayer times in prison in Rome. Paul found it pertinent to pray in each season, as he wrote to the Thessalonians, to pray without ceasing. And remember the desire and need to pray was tied to the fellowship of that first day in Philippi? Well, actually, prayer was woven into the fiber of all the fruit of that first trip there in Philippi. In addition to Lydia and her household, that small church in Philippi had a young woman who was converted a demon-possessed girl, one who brought her master's much profit by fortune-telling. And this girl greatly annoyed Paul because as they walked through town, she would yell after them, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Well, what she said was true, not exactly the PR you want for the gospel. The crazy demon girl seeped in the occult, yelling about you, scaring off people who were probably already suspicious about these Jewish dudes showing up who were hanging out down by the river. But guess what led to this encounter with her, with this demon-possessed girl? It says in Acts 16, 16, Now it happened as we went to prayer. Paul and his group were going back to the river to pray. It was part of their time in Philippi, the consistent seeking of Jesus. And he was moving as a result of it. So now we have Lydia and her family, and now the demon-possessed girl, the fellowship of those first days that Paul's remembering with fondness, both of them inspired by going to pray. But look, at what happens after this. Next, after Paul gets greatly annoyed by the demon-possessed fortune-telling girl, we see in Acts 16 verses 18 through 31. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. What power there is in the name of Jesus. The hour the demon left her, he set her free that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Interesting that they called something good evil. They were blinded to the good thing that just took place. The world will now rejoice at the work of God, seeing people set free from their sin. They won't exactly do that. And then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. More stripes on Paul's back, stripes that he bore in his body as a testimony to his faithfulness in Christ. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Then back in Acts 16, and when they had laid many stripes on them, on Paul and Silas, they threw them into prison commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, listen to what was going on. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So what's going on here? The circumstances are unfortunate, tragic in fact. Rejected, misunderstood, tried, beaten, forsaken, and yet they are praying and seeking God. And again, the Lord does something big. Don't miss this. In Philippi, going to the river to pray, Lydia and her household, the first converts in Europe, going to pray, a demon-possessed girl gets delivered, a sister in Christ, and the whole city gets stirred up due to the power of the gospel. Redeeming the, the time to pray in prison, God moves in Philippi yet again. He's not done yet. Look at this. What happens when they're praying? We read in chapter 16 again. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Open doors. 
They all have the chance to make the prison break. And what do they do? It goes on. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? God, once again, the Lord having opened a heart in Philippi to heed the things spoken by Paul. And so they said to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Does what Paul writes years later from this Roman imprisonment make more sense now? The thread continues. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship with the gospel from the first day until now. The fellowship. From the first day until now, the first day, Lydia and her family, the demon-possessed girl, a jailer and his family, there may have been others, of course, but only those are recorded, and it's a small, sweet fellowship. A group of people with nothing in common. A seasoned Pharisee turned missionary, his newly circumcised assistant Timothy, a half-Jew, half-Greek, a wealthy foreign businesswoman and her family, a crazy girl that everyone has been dealing with with her mental health issues, and a government worker in the prison system with his family after midnight. Only Jesus could bring these people together. And Paul was thankful and joyful over that fellowship. In our modern thinking, we think of fellowship as hanging out with believers we get along with pretty well, usually in a more social setting. Talking to a buddy at church, getting together for coffee with other believers, and certainly conversing and socializing with other Christians is a part of fellowship and a good thing. We need to seek that. We need to have that in our lives. That's a healthy Christian life to have that embedded, how our heart is lightened when we hang out with other Christians. But much more wholesome our time is together with them than with some of our other friends. But when it comes to fellowship, hanging out with someone else who believes is not the whole story, not just hanging out. The word fellowship that Paul uses is koinonia. It has the idea of joint partnership, a mutual sharing, a deep intimacy, a committed participation by all sides, sharing all things at the deepest level, giving lives for one another. And Paul had that koinonia with the church in Philippi. Lydia persuaded them to come to her house and stay. A group of guys she had never met before, telling her teenage kids, change your sheets, kids. These guys, these guys are spending the night cooking up meals for four hungry missionaries. And I can tell you from experience, single missionary dudes can eat a lot. Suffering alongside a young girl who was rejected by her masters, no longer profitable to them when she lost her fortune-telling powers, left without the covering and protection and provisions she once had. A distraught man, the prison guard, the prison keeper, anxiety-filled and contemplating suicide because everything had gone wrong. He had failed, apparently, and it all rested on his shoulders. But receiving the good news and washing the bloody wounds of Paul and Silas, then inviting them home and feeding them with whatever he had in his cupboards, this was true, raw, intimate fellowship. No pretense, no filter. Just real people going through real stuff that God had brought into one another's lives for a bigger divine purpose. And that is the koinonia that Paul remembered. And now in prison, he longed for with joy. So he visited it in prayer since he couldn't be with him there in person. And as Paul reflected upon the church in Philippi, he considers one more thing in verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul expresses his confidence here. Even though years had passed and seasons had changed, even though Paul had moved on from Philippi and served elsewhere, even though hardships had continued to come and circumstances had changed, Paul was confident that Jesus had started a good work in the Philippian believers and in Philippi, and that Jesus would complete that work until the day of Jesus, until his return or until he took them home to be with him in heaven. Paul knew that God was going to be faithful to those friends in Philippi. Paul didn't know if he could do anything more for them other than pray and write. Paul didn't know if he could visit them again and encourage them. Paul didn't know if he could send anything their way to provide their needs. But Paul was not worried that the work in Philippi was dependent upon himself. He was confident that he who began the good work, Jesus, would be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
God was going to be faithful to them. He was committed fully. And what gave Paul this confidence? Well, today we looked at the first days of Philippi, the small beginnings, the sweet memories that Paul had of that time. And now years later, notice who Paul writes to in this letter back in verse 1. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Back in the first days in Philippi, it had been just a handful of believers clinging to Jesus. Now, saints and bishops and deacons were in Philippi. Bishops and deacons shows that there was a well-established church there now, with leadership and roles and authority, with decisions being made and ministries being served. A significant body of believers, a presence of Jesus in Philippi that God was caring for by the hands of the local leaders, those bishops and deacons. Things had surely grown since Paul had been there. When he left, it was a tiny garden in the Lord's work. Lydia and her family, the prison guard and his family, this demon-possessed girl, maybe a few others. And now it was a forest, something that God had done. Paul saw the evidence that God had been faithful to begin the work and would complete it. And it wasn't dependent upon Paul. And he didn't see this just in Philippi. Paul saw this in village after village, town after town, city after city. Paul saw that Jesus had prepared the work, opening people's hearts to heed the things that he spoke. And that Jesus had continued the work, even when it was time for Paul to move on. How freeing this was for Paul. And he could say with confidence, as he did to the Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but God is the one who gave the increase. As Paul sat in prison in Rome, it gave him time to reflect. And there, tethered down and no longer free to roam about, he discovered something about the Lord he may not have noticed before. God was faithful. God will always come through. God will never fail. God will never drop the ball. God is more invested in the lives of those that we care about, in the ministries we labor hard in, and in the course and direction of society and our communities and this world. And in confidence, we can declare, as Paul did, that he who began that good work, he will complete it. We can't always predict what people will do, can we? They may walk away. They will occasionally disappoint. They might make questionable choices. They may not show up when needed. Or they may be called on by God, taking steps of faith that lead them away from us, where we think that we need them. But Jesus will not stop working until the day that we go to be with him. God will always remember his children. We are not an afterthought. We are not forgotten or forsaken. Isaiah wrote, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. That's what they thought, at least. But the Lord's answer to them, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. And what would he do to ensure they would not forget? It says in the next verse, See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Jesus' nail-pierced hands are a testimony of his faithfulness to us. That while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. He will never leave us, nor forsake us. If he has told us, then he will come again for us. His memory for us is great. He will not forget us. What he will forget, though, it's amazing. It's our sins and our lawless deeds. He will remember no more. So while he will never forget you, he's forgotten what we have done. And he is committed to the work of refining us and changing us and conforming us into his image and sanctifying us and filling us and using us and empowering us if he is truly our God, if he is truly my God faithful to do all those things, committed to complete them until the day of Jesus Christ, for those that are in Jesus Christ. And until that day, we say, Amen. <laughs>